My name is Terry Covey, and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you, and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you, and have a great day. We are very fortunate today to have a, a man and his wife with us who've been great spiritual leaders, not only to a church, but to this county this community for, for a number of years. And Pastor Larry Holland and his, his lovely wife, Ginger, are with us today. Pastor Holland was the pastor of Franklin Heights Baptist Church for over 41 years. He's now the pastor emeritus there at that church. Retired a few years ago, but he's in great demand going to many churches. And, and many churches love to have Pastor Holland come and speak. And he's been here at Twin Oaks several times. And Lord willing, we'll have him several times more. We love to hear him preach God's Word to us. He's been married for 52 years. They have two children, one son, David, who's now with the Lord, and then a daughter, Deborah, who, is she still a teacher at CHA? No. She retired, okay, as a teacher from CHA, but it is a pleasure to have Pastor Holland with us. I'm very thankful for him for not only being here today, but uh, a good friend to me. There have been many times that I have called him, and when he was pastor there at Franklin Heights, I would go to him, and he would take time with me, and I would ask him for, for guidance on what we should do as a church, because we were growing so much, and I knew that God had used that church and used him, and so one of the things I learned early in life is to go to someone that's wiser than yourself and get that advice and that guidance, and he has helped us uh, as a church in, in a great, great way. Pastor Holland, when I called him uh, here a while back and asked him, he would come and speak. He said, Brother Terry, he said, I just finished praying for you. And I thought, that's my kind of guy, you know. And I want you to know I have prayed for you every day since I've asked you to come and speak for us. And we have tried to give you plenty of time to just uh, to not feel hemmed in and to just let the Holy Spirit work through you. And, Brother, please come and bless our hearts. All right. How, how is that? All right. Okay. I... Uh... I'm going to get wound up. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to thank those who are this wonderful music. I really enjoyed it. When the worship war started in uh, our convention, I told our church, we uh, were not going to fuss over the style of music because God is more concerned about the condition of your heart than how and what you sing. But I was preaching at the Roanoke Civic Center to uh, the Virginia Baptist Convention. And of course, we had a lot of aristocratic people from Richmond. And I thought, well, I'll give them something to think about. And we were talking about church music. I told them, I said, I like all kind of church music, country and Western. <laughs> and uh, so thank you for the wonderful music today. I love your pastor. I pray for him regularly. I pray for your church. And I've done this for years. I, I think that prayer is perhaps the most neglected ministry of the church. And I uh, asked God when I retired at 69, six years ago, and he gave me a verse, uh, a couple of them, and it says, even when I am old and gray, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation. And the Lord has allowed me to have really more opportunities, and I've had Sundays available. But I turned 75 in July, and I kind of made a promise to my wife that I would slow down. She has been my faithful companion for almost 53 years. Uh, she got an A-plus for being a pastor's wife, and I, she has been my constant companion, and she is dear to my heart. But I love your church. I was holding a series of meetings in this area about a year ago, and I would pass here on Sunday morning, and I would see all the cars, and I would thank God for how He has blessed your church. You've got a wonderful group of people, and I know many of you, and I love all of you, and uh, you have to love me because we're told in First John, if you don't, you die and go to hell. So, <laughs> uh, I, uh, 
Uh, brother, would you hand me the water? Thank you, John Fry, for putting this up here and having no water in it. <laughs> and, uh, so um, I, uh, I said that in a church service one time at Franklin Heights, and uh, it really upset a fellow. He didn't. But if you read 1 John, uh, God says, how can you say that you love uh, God whom you have not seen and then not love a brother you, whom you have seen. So I do believe that it's important that we ought to love each other. And I do love you in the Lord, and this is a great church. Now I want you to turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the last uh, historical book of the Old Testament. And I'll explain why that's true in a minute. And since we stood for that good singing, I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to read five verses out of chapter 2. Nehemiah, pastor, that's in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter 2, and we begin in verse 1. And today I want to talk to you about what God does with the man and the woman uh, that will allow him to do it. And the title of my sermon is, What Kind of Church Would My Church Be If... And then I will add to that as we go along. The Holy Spirit said through the writer, And it came about in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king, and now I had not been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, Why is your face sad, though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very afraid. And I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad? When the city, the place of my father's tomb, lies desolate, and its gates have been consumed by fire. Then the king said to me, What would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tomb, that I may rebuild it. Thank you, and may God add his blessings to the reading of his word. In the last month or so, I have been, as you know, the Bible is like a gold mine. The more you dig, the more uh, gold nuggets of God's precious truth. And so for a month, I've been studying the book of Nehemiah, not just to learn more about the Bible, but to dig out truths that will help me be the man God wants me to be. One of the dangers of studying the Bible, if all you do is just have Bible knowledge, and do you not let the Holy Spirit transform your life to be more like Jesus, then that's like the Pharisees, it deadens us. And so I ask God to, to teach me something from the book of Nehemiah. And... I want to talk to you today. I had a lady about 30 years ago, and I used to get a lot of cassette tapes and uh, CDs and DVDs and all those things because I guess folks thought I needed help, and I did. I needed all the help I could get, but she gave me a little cassette tape, and I don't remember anything the pastor said on that tape, but I remember the title. And the title of that cassette, and he was a warm-hearted preacher. Uh, I could tell he had not had a lot of formal education, but he had a warm heart for God. And the title of his message is, was, What kind of church would my church be if every member was just like me? And through the years, I have reflected and ruminated and thought about that question. What kind of church would Franklin Heights be if every member was just like me? 
And folks, that's a good question for this good church. What kind of church would Twin Oaks be if every member in his Christian and in her Christian life was exactly like you? Now, Nehemiah as a book reveals not only the work of God, but it gives to us a profile of the man of God, the kind of man and and by application, the kind of woman that God uses. But in order to understand the book, we have to have some background. So if you allow me a couple of minutes to give you the background. I said it was the last historical book in the Old Testament, and that's true. You said, well, how about Malachi? Well, he was the prophet ministering during this time. When you get to Nehemiah, you are generally in the area of 425 B.C. to 400 B.C. And you remember there are 400 years between the Old and New Testament. But in the year 586, because Israel, though the prophets would preach, repent, and turn to God, turn back to God, Israel, pray to God for mercy, get on your knees, return to God. They thumb their nose at God, and the rubber band of God's mercy and love and unconditional forgiveness snapped. And in the year 586 AD, uh, BC, God sent King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, and they came and overthrew Judah, and they took them captive back to Babylon for 70 years. And you can read about that in Jeremiah 52. And now several hundred years has passed. The, se the, the 70 years has already come and gone, twice that number. But you see, Israel had settled down in Babylon. They had become comfortable in 70 years, you can marry and have children. You can have grandchildren. And so Babylon had become their home. And some of them had gone back after 70 years, but most of them had remained in Babylon. And before we get to Nehemiah, 14 years prior to that, then a man called Ezra took a group back to try to begin to rebuild the great city of God called Jerusalem. And 14 years later, and by the way, Ezra is mentioned 14 times in the book of Nehemiah. So what we've got here is Ezra and Nehemiah, and we have prophets like Ezekiel and Daniel. Ezekiel and Daniel are, by the way, the two prophets that were born in Judah, but they died in Babylon. And folks, historically, we cannot comprehend and the, the implication and the devastation it was for the city of God to be overthrown by a godless king called Nebuchadnezzar. But the city of God was laid waste. That great city that uh, the psalmist said, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? But he that has clean hands and a pure heart. City was, uh, Jerusalem was a great city. But now it's in ruin because God's people would not listen to the prophets of God and to the preachers of God and because they would not listen to God, the hammer of God's judgment fell, and it occurs to me, how long will America thumb its nose at God? How long will this great nation that I love and you love, 
have been blessed of God. It was predicated upon the Judeo-Christian ethic. I have read some of the charters of the original colonies, and they refer to Jesus Christ and the Christian gospel. And today these historical revisionists want to say this was not founded as a Christian nation. It's a lie. It began on the precepts of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the point I'm trying to make. In all of these 270 whatever years it's been, there have been only two great awakenings. And it's been over 150 years, and we have not seen a great mighty movement of God. Folks, the greatest need in America is not a change in the White House. It is for the people of God to get on their knees and beg God for mercy. And you see, God sent that nation of Babylon to take them into captivity. And you and I need to know that we're living in perilous times. Judge Robert Bork says, if God does not judge America, no, that was Billy Graham's wife, Ro Ju Judge Robert Bork said that as a nation we are slouching towards Sodom. Folks, we're not slouching, we're already there. And today, as a nation, we don't blush about anything, and we're not ashamed of anything. Everything goes. And now we have politicians in high places saying that we ought to celebrate diversity, which is a code word for something that is an abomination in the sight of God. And that's the reason if there's any hope for America, it's because the church, judgment must begin at the house of God. And here we have a nation in captivity. And if you want to know how bad the captivity was, read Psalm 137. It begins that we sat down by the rivers of Babylon and we wept. And the last verse says, Blessed are those who dash their little ones against a rock. Now, that is how bad it was to be in Babylonian captivity. And so now we fast forward to around 425 B.C. We have a man called Nehemiah who is in the presence of King Artaxerxes. Now, by this time... Babylon has fallen, and Persia had overthrown Babylon, and now Israel, uh, or those who are left, are under Persian dominance. King Artaxerxes is a Persian king. And there's a man there who is a cupbearer. Now, that's not just somebody who drinks wine and to see if it's poison for the king. Uh, a cupbearer was a man who had a responsible position, and Nehemiah, a Jew, had a responsible position, but he was a believing Jew. He was a God-fearing Jew, and he loved God. And it says that in the presence of the king, the king says, Why is your face sad, though you are not sick? And then I was very much afraid. You know why he said that? Because in the place of royalty, no one was to show any sadness. Now, you might be falling apart in your life, and things might be going terrible, but in the presence of the king, you were to be happy. And he was afraid because the king noticed that Nehemiah was sad. And so he said, why are you so sad? And Nehemiah said, well, why shouldn't I be sad? Because as a Jew, I know that the beloved city of God is still desolate and still in waste. And then what do you want? And he said, so I prayed to God. Now, what is the first thing I want you to know about Nehemiah? Nehemiah was the kind of man, and I might even use the word Christian, that's a New Testament word, but you know what I mean. Nehemiah was the kind of man who was concerned about the things that God was concerned about. And folks, we need in our churches people 
who are concerned about what concerns the heart of God. You know, when the market went south in 2008, we got all concerned. Our portfolios and all of this stuff, we didn't know what was going to happen, and people lost their job, and that's a bad thing. But folks, let me tell you something. The thing that's on the heart of God, most of all, is not the state of the economy. The thing on the heart of God is that the church in America refuses to listen to God. And we've got preachers like your pastor and other preachers who are preaching and speaking the Word of God. But folks, it's been 150 years and we have not seen a real Holy Ghost revival in America. And we uh, have changed and I'm not opposed to change. I know I'm old as dirt, but the point is uh, I, I've asked God, let me be open to change. And, and, and music has changed and worship has changed. And, and, I, and, and I'm for all that. And I'm not against any of that. But I'll tell you what has not changed. The call of God for his people to get on their knees and cry out for God to send a great revival. Here is Nehemiah. He said, why should my face not be sad when the city, uh, the, the, when the city, the place of my father's tomb lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? And then the king said, what is your request? And then he said, so I prayed to the God of heaven. And then I said to the king, if it please the king, if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah so that my father's tomb that I, and that I may rebuild it. You see, God was concerned about his city. It's the city of God, Jerusalem, the city of peace, Jerusalem, where they worship God. And folks, it's hard in vocabulary words to describe the heart of God when his city had to be judged by a godless nation of Babylon. And now we have a man who's Nehemiah, and he's concerned about the things that concern the heart of God. And folks, I believe the greatest need in America is not for us to get a change in the White House, though personally I wouldn't be opposed to that, the greatest need in America is a spiritual awakening. And we need it. You need it. You need it. I need it. We need somehow, if we would pray and confess our sins and get serious with God and to recognize the greatest thing on the heart of God is not our happiness, it is but our, it's our holiness. And folks, we, we're living in a day when we are convinced that God wants us all to be happy. I'm not against happiness, but the heart of God pulsates with the desire for people to want to be like His Son, Jesus Christ. We don't need more happy people. We may need more holy people. We need people who know what it is to get on their knees before God. And by the way, that's the second thing I learned about Nehemiah. Not only, first of all, was he concerned about the things that concerned the heart of God. And there have been times when I um, have been praying to God. And I said, Lord, you know the heart, my, my heart is burdened, and all of us, the longer I live, the more I realize life's not easy. I mean, almost every day I run into people whose lives are hard. And you know, there are some of you here this morning, and you're singing, and this wonderful choir has led us in some wonderful worship, but your heart is broken over something. 
Life is not easy. Maybe there's health problems or financial problems or marriage problems or a host of other things. Life is not easy, but I'm saying to you is that even in the midst of difficulty, here was a man whose heart was broken, but God had a plan for a man whose heart was broken. And you might be here today and your heart may be broken over something. And all of your dreams may not have come true. And maybe your dreams were dashed on the rocks of difficult circumstances. But I'm here to tell you, God is still on the throne. And I'll say this. I... Um, and losing a, a, a son is no, no worse than some of the stuff that you've gone through. Not a bit worse. But I remember when the Marine Corps came and they do just like they do on TV. They knock on your door. And when they told us that our son had been killed in the Marine Corps, my precious wife and I, we went and as people began to gather back to the bedroom, we got on our knees and we said, God, we don't know anything about any of this. And our minds cannot grasp the gra gravity of what this is, means. But God, if you will give us the grace, we want your name to be glorified. What I'm going to tell you today, folks, life is hard. And some of you have had it worse than losing a child. But God is still on his throne. He's still in his heaven. He still is going to have his will done. And we have a man who is sensitive to what God is sensitive to. The second thing I learned about Nehemiah was that he was a man of prayer. Um, in verse, chapter 1, verse 4, it says, And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He was a man who fasted and prayed. In verse 6 of chapter 1, it says, He was praying night and day for the sons of Israel. In chapter 2, verse 4, he says, So I prayed to the God of heaven. And then you get over to chapter 4, verse 9, and then it says, And then we prayed. He was a man of prayer. I retired. In fact, uh, the end of this month will be six years. And I knew just like it's happening, my body begins to slow down. I don't have the energy I used to have. But I knew that if God would let me have a mind that I could go further in the school of prayer. And the other day, I counted the books that I have on prayer. And I have 20-something books on prayer. And I've read some of them two or three times. I said, God, I, I want you to to let me go further, as Andrew Murray said, in the school of prayer. Amen. And that's the reason for years I have prayed for the Twin Oaks Baptist Church. I have prayed for your pastor for years because I believe that God is looking for people who know how to pray. If I were to ask you, do you pray, most, if not all, would say yes. But if I change the question just a little bit, and ask you, do you have a real prayer life? How many would you be, all of us would be able to say, I have a real prayer life? And folks, God is looking for people who can stand in the gap. People who can lay hold of the horns of the altar and beg a sovereign, holy God that if he in his inimitable mercy will have mercy on the church and mercy on America, God is looking for men and women of prayer. The great uh, writer E.M. Bounds, who was a... Um, chaplain during the Civil War, he said, men are looking for better methods. God is looking for better men and women of prayer. And I believe that's true. And it's my humble but honest and accurate opinion that the greatest or the weakest link in the average church, I don't know about this church, but the weakest link in the church 
is this matter of prayer. Now think with me just a moment. Jesus said, men ought always to pray. And you remember the disciples, they came to him and said, Lord, teach us to witness. Teach us to preach. Teach us how to organize. No. The thing that the disciples saw in John the Baptist was that his followers knew how to pray, and the disciples who had been with the Lord, who had camped with the Lord, who had heard the Lord and saw him heal, they said, Lord, would you teach us how to pray? And the greatest need, as far as I know, and, it's, and you may disagree, and when we get to heaven, maybe I'm wrong, but I believe the greatest need in the church today is for the church to reclaim the great ministry of Holy Ghost pray. Hallelujah, God. Now, you see, Paul said, devote yourself to prayer. I've, I've learned three things about prayer. Prayer is worship, and all of us know that. Uh, you know, the, the, the psalmist said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who uh, forgives all of our sins, who heals all of our diseases. So we worship God when we pray. But not only is prayer worship, but prayer is warfare. And you remember when Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and, and, and high places. Paul is talking about that when we enter into our prayer closet or our place of prayer, we are doing battle with the evil one. Prayer is worship, prayer is warfare, and then prayer, now get this, I want you to remember, three W's, prayer is worship, prayer is warfare, but prayer is work. If you're going to be a praying Christian, you're going to find out, and this is what I've discovered, it's work to pray. Now, if all I'm talking about is praying a little in the morning, a little bit to God, and that be it, you know, well, then that's all right. That's not work. But if you're going to be a prayer warrior, if you're going to be somebody that can stand in the gap and pray, if you're going to be a man and woman who understands what it is to enter into the inner sanctuary of the heart of God and grip hold of the altar of God and to understand and feel the presence of God, we must do the work of prayer. And you remember twice in the New Testament, Jesus himself said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And how many churches do you know that are known for praying? We know churches that are great in music, and we know churches that have great preachers, and we know churches that are big, and we're big into mega churches. Folks, I got a news flash for you. God is not as interested in numbers as we are. He is interested in the condition of our hearts when we come to worship Him. And I say to you that the heart of God is that somehow we would be people who know how to pray. And I've asked, Lord, Lord, teach me to help me to go further in the school of prayer. A.J. Gordon said, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. And I believe that's right. If you're not a man of prayer, if you're not a woman of prayer, in fact, let me say this to you. You tell me where you really are in your prayer life. 
Tell me where you are in your prayer life. I'm not interested in where you are and how many Bible verses you can quote. Now, I'm, I'm not against that. And I'm not interested in how many Bible studies you go to, and I'm not against that. But, folks, this is just my honest opinion. I believe we've got enough Bible studies. We need more getting in touch with God prayer meetings. And every church I go into, and I've, I've, I've preached in a lot of churches in the last six years. Every church, I don't care how little, how big, every church I've gone into, as far as I can remember, we got PowerPoints. But folks, you know something? We need more than PowerPoints. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to know what it is to pray. And the reason uh, most of us don't get to that level is because we don't want to do the work of prayer. You know, we want to say a few prayers and ask God to bless the missionaries and the sick and the afflicted. And, you know, we want to give God a nod, but we worship God in prayer and we understand the warfare of prayer. And, 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 and Paul says, put on the whole armor of God and he told us the parts of the armor because, you see, the Christian life is not a playground. It's a battleground. And we need the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit and the breastplate of righteousness and all the other parts. And then in, when he gets through with that, of the different parts of the Christian armor, he says, and with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. So we can have all this other stuff. We can have the helmet of salvation. But folks, what we need is to have people. God is looking for people. Nehemiah was a man who prayed. He prayed and he fasted and the people prayed. And because they prayed, God listened to his prayer. And finally because I know you're getting hungry. And at 75, I'm running out of steam. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make to you is that not only was he a man who concerned himself with the things that concerned the heart of God, not only was he a man of prayer, and, and, I, and I'm not going to tell you about my prayer life. I... I get into trouble, and, 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 and you, will, you think, well, I'm... And, you know, I don't know where God has me in the school of prayer, but I know, by God's grace, I'm not where I used to be. And I know that the, the desire of my heart, when I get up early in the morning... And you young people, you don't understand this, but if God lets you live to 75, getting up is work. <laughs> and you have to get going. But I know the hunger of my heart is to get my Bible and to get my prayer notebook and to get some book on prayer and spend time with God. I desire that as much as food for my body. And I say to you, if God could raise up churches who have a hunger for prayer, who had prayer warriors. Oh, folks, the greatest need in America is for God to be able to come in our churches. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And folks, coming to church and singing, and I'll, I'm for all that. But Jesus wanted to teach his disciples to pray. And Jesus got upset because uh, they had made the house of God something besides what he wanted it to be. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. The third and final thing is that Nehemiah was a man who understood God's divine purpose. And I want to read two verses from chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 17, it says, Then I said to them, this is Nehemiah. <clears throat> you see the bad situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and the gates are burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. 
so that we no longer will be a reproach. You see, you see, when Jerusalem was overthrown, the heathen nations made, made fun of the God of Israel. And folks in America today, comedians are making fun of our God. And they think they're being cute, but when they bust hell wide open, they'll understand that God is a God of who He says He is. And uh, I'm just not whistling Dixie here. This is the Word of God. I believe there's a heaven to gain, but I believe there's a hell to shun. And here was a man who had the heart of God, and he said... Uh, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. So no longer will the heathen make fun of us like they do in America today. And I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's word which he had spoken to me. And listen, I love this. Then they said, and it wasn't just the preacher who said it, wasn't just our beloved Pastor Terry. It said, then they, that's talking about the people of God. Then they said, let us rise up and build. And so they put their hands to the good work. Let me tell you something. You know what the good work is? The good work is the work of God. Every job that we have is important. As long as it's legal and legitimate, it's important. But folks, I'm, I'm old-fashioned, and I believe nothing is more important than the work of God. And what God is doing here is important work. It's a good work. It's a holy work. It's God's work. And don't dare do anything to mess it up, okay? And that's the reason I began this sermon with the question... What kind of church would my church be if every member was just like me? Folks, be honest. Would it be a praying church? Would it be a forgiving church? Would it be a giving church? Would it be a church that criticizes that is bitter, that complains? What kind of church would my church be if every member was just like me? And I've heard about maybe y'all have got plans to build. I don't know anything about that, but I, I guarantee because I believe in this church, uh, a prayer has gone in to whatever decision y'all make. And it's just not something we've decided to do. You see, a lot of times in the Christian life, we decide to do something and we ask God to bless it. You got it turned around. We need to find the mind of God. God, what do you want us to do? What's your will? What's your way? How do you want us to do it? And if we'll do the will of God, God will answer and make ready all the details. And just because you're doing the good work of God doesn't mean that you're not going to have problems. I don't have time to get into it because I've done too much studying. But here, when they began to build the wall, there were people like Tobiah and people like Geshem and people like that who said to Nehemiah, come down and let's talk about it. That was a code word. We ain't never done it like that before. I get sick of those people in those little old churches that I preach to, and I go out, and, and boy, they sit there, and, and, and they think I'm a holiness preacher. We ain't never heard that before. The point I'm trying to make, folks, is what God wants us to do. And people will try to get us to come off the wall. And there were people, and here Nehemiah and his people of God, they were rebuilding the wall. They were laying the brick, and they said, come down from the wall. And his reply was, hand me another brick. Yes, he kept at the work of God. Brother Terry, just keep on keeping on for the glory of God. Amen. And so my final question is this. What kind of church would Twin Oaks be 
if every member was just like me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your precious, immutable, unchanging, authoritative word. We thank you, Lord, for this good church. We thank you, Father, for people who are here today. Some of them have come with heavy hearts. And Lord, all of God's children have difficulty. It's not a bed of roses. Hard. And I pray, Lord, that you would encourage those who are burdened today. And then I pray that your Holy Spirit would move and God, you would speak to our hearts about what we ought to do. If we haven't been praying like we ought to, God, help us to make a covenant to be prayer warriors. God, we need pray, praying people. And so, Lord, if there's somebody here today that has never accepted you as their personal Savior, nothing is more important than knowing that when we draw our last breath, we'll go into the presence of Jesus. And so, God, speak to our hearts today, I pray. And I make this prayer in the name that is above every name. Oh, the precious, wonderful, magnificent, hallelujah, name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm not sure what kind of invitation really to give, but I, I've been thinking about it, and um, and I'm on. Are we, are we going to have an invitation? Okay, all right. <laughs> now, if the Lord's spoken to you in any way today, and I know this church has an altar, and and there's something that you want to speak to the Lord about today. It might be about your prayer life. It might be a burden on your heart. I know God's people hurt. I had a man the other day, I sat down in the library and I had witnessed to him. I'd saw him in the library a lot and so I thought I'd better witness to him. And he told me he was a, a, a child of God. He accepted Christ as his Savior. In fact, he, had, he said, I've been to hear you preach and that was, you know, a long time ago at Franklin Heights and Yesterday, I got to talking to him, and you know what was on his heart? He, he's about 80, and he said, Preacher, he said, life's hard. He said, why, why does the Lord want us to go through these things? And we talked about it. So if, you, if your heart's burdened today, come and talk to the Lord. Or if you've never been saved, you don't know, you're not sure about where you're going to spend eternity, come and talk to the pastor. And, and if that, God wants you to do that, well, I'm not even going to stand the invitation, but if you need to come, we're going to sing a couple of stanzas. If you want to pray or if you want to speak to me or the pastor, let's stand together and we're going to sing. Mm -hmm.